footage from the camera. So literally as we're sitting here, um, it's, it's getting exported onto um, essentially the desktop uh, down in the lab. And then from there, uh, what we're doing is we're we're taking the images from an entire dive. Sometimes we'll split it up and just do parts of a dive depending on, on how long it is and how long it'll take to process. But um, we'll throw those images um, into our photogrammetry program. Um, and then from there, what we're doing is we're trying to build models of specific sites. So if we dove or if we kind of mapped like three or four different sites in one dive, it'll give us uh, multiple components, which will just be different models within one um, folder. Um, otherwise, we can do it sort of individually ourselves. Um, and then uh, what, what we do is we align the images first, which means that the program is just looking for similar points between um, individual photos so they can kind of stack them on top of each other. Um, from there, it's, it's what's called tie points. Um, essentially, it ties those photos together, right? So the more tie points, the better the model fits, the higher the resolution will be. Um, and that's where with photogrammetry, you, you kind of give and take certain things. If you take a lot of photos, you can get higher resolution, but it's going to take a lot longer to process. Um, and there's kind of a, a window in there of kind of the ideal number of photos you want, where you where more doesn't really give you that much more resolution. It only j just may, takes more time. So um, we're working with that. With the ROVs also, um, this is something where, where we've been, uh, Jonathan's been sitting here trying to figure it out, testing different times to figure out how we can get that exact. Obviously, too much is better than too little in this instance. Um, and then from there, yeah, we, we run those models, they align, they merge, and then the, there's a couple more steps in there where we're um, texturing the model, coloring the model, uh, and then from there we can also even tie it and georeference it so it's that we can kind of put it on a map where it, where it literally is. So um, it's, it's a lot of kind of um, organization on the front end to make it work. And then as long as we, we do that, um, we've been saying down there is, is if we have models to make, that means everybody else was able to do their job and it's up to us to do our job at that point. And um, it's, it's kind of been the theme of the trip. We've had quite a few models built already. Um, we'll still be continuing to make more as, as we finish this up. Yeah, I, Zach, what you just said about the resolution versus size is so on point. Um, we are collecting massive amounts of data here. Um, and creating models that are frankly just ridiculously detailed. Uh, the one that we produced last night was like 200 million triangles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For the, hundreds so of for millions. The, for the 3D modelers out there, that is just uh, an incredible amount of detail. Yeah. Several and orders of magnitude more than is realistic. And you guys have been pushing the cameras too, right? You've ha been having to give them ice baths to get all the data <laughs> off yeah. of them because there's so much. There's so much data, and it's a... It's a good example of, um, of uh, the consequences of uh, deploying new technologies like this, right? Like that's, and that's also part of why we're here on this job, like, or uh, I'm sorry, on this cruise. How much data is too much? Uh, what do we do with the 200 million triangle? Um, Let's see if we come up yeah, and we see what that next tier is like, if there's anything interesting up at that next layer. And then how do we, um, and what's the utility then of saving things? So like. I do believe that one day, 10 years, there's going to be a master's or a PhD student that is going to be like, I cannot believe and thank you for saving this model or at least saving the images that uh, captured this moment. Because then you could do the comparative analyses. What type of biology grew on here in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Um, we're already using those kind of data from our first uh, views of the degradation of Titanic as a great example. Um, so although it's a pain, and although it's super not ideal, um, that is exactly why we're here to test, to say, OK, well, we've just brought down these super advanced cinematography cameras, and we can do this, and we can do that. Um, let's now weigh the balance of should we. Yeah. How much is it going to cost to upgrade the Ethernet bottle so we don't have to put ice bags on our cameras to download them all night? Is that worth it for the utility you get for future science or for scientists? Yeah. Jonathan, so, so Dan, we're just coming up, um, uh, just checking out the extent of this wall. So Atalanta still has like a hard target there. And I'm curious if it's kind of like, you know, we're seeing this slope here. We saw that sheer wall. Now we've got a little bit of a slope. We can see if there's another wall up there as we go. Um, just kind of going vertically up and down as we're, as we're coming along our track. Um, I've pushed us a little bit closer 
to uh, the cliff, so I don't know that we can uh, we, we can certainly go back and back off if we want to get to that lower layer, but just kind of as we explore the zigzag across here, um, just let me know if you'd like to do anything different. Yeah, we're, we're still looking for th good things, so I would say go up, go down, you know, okay. let's explore the up, see if it's any good, if not, head on back down to the bottom, you know. Okay. ROV is yours. Roger. Um, Atalanta is still swinging, but I'm, I might uh, bring us back south rather than 200. Um, yeah. to, if that'll keep us, I don't want to get too high up the wall. Um, although there is plenty of wall here. Oh, you got a hard target coming up on it. Um, I might pause on that till we uh, we'll get the changeover. Jonathan, we have a question. How do you manage data storage and how many terabytes does it take for a standard dive? We're recording about two to four, two to three terabytes on a dive, depending on how, what we're filming. And uh, we're recording this all to a 30 terabyte NAS rate array. That's uh, kind of the principal storage and we back everything up on a tape. Um, I think the question of managing data storage is actually much deeper, and it's kind of a fun problem to have, fun and scary, um, which is, uh, you know, how do, how do you safely transport the data between different servers? That's the biggest thing, because um, especially for the immersive filmmaking, if you lose a frame, that's a big deal. Um, and uh, we have so much data from different places, and uh, that's where our uh, fantastic uh, uh, science manager for this cruise, Taylor Ann, uh, it's really kept us in order um, in terms of uh, saying which, what data needs to go where, how do we actually uh, kind of uh, write down and keep track of all the different metadata that goes in and out. Because uh, that's, that's almost more important than where do you store it, is uh, what is it uh, when you're coming up with literally tens of thousands of images across the last couple of days. This question is for Mike and Jonathan. Uh, with the Atalanta lights, is that a um, is that a factor of, of which lights are on or how we've angled them? Re repeat the question. Just the, the Atalanta lights, like, see how the tether is kind of leaving that light pool? I wasn't sure if we if you had uh, angled them for your purposes. I'm just curious. Oh, no, don't worry about that. Atalanta's lights? Yeah, had you had you oriented them for your... Yes. Okay. Uh, well, we, we took all of the lights... We took half of the lights and columnated them all to a single point source. And okay. I think that Dan, and once he pops on, he can provide more detail. I think we kept the second row of lights at the current kind of spread. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. I just saw that we were kind of leaving that light pole more often than, uh, than yeah, yeah, I yeah. was familiar with and was wondering if there was a change or if I was losing my mind. Yeah, no, we helped. We, we tried to, like, concentrate the light a little bit more. Okay. Knowing that Dan's coming on watch here, I'm in increasing the size of the fisheye view. So Dan, our strike here, you can see from our prior Norbit was along here. Um, I've kind of moved us up the wall, so there is certainly much more wall below you um, that we've kind of now uh, brought Atalanta a little bit more towards. So we we're too close to be exploring that lower section at the moment, uh, just to, we wanted to see what was kind of going on up the wall. Can you uh, zoom in on the nav screen? Will do. You are 10 meters from the wall, so you're too close. You need to move away. Um, so what I was hoping to do um, is to keep Atalanta uh, with the winch, kind of winching up and keeping you. Wall? Yeah, okay. I want to see us. Come up, um, right. Come up, come up. Come up. We'll, we'll explore a little Ray's more up the wall. breaking the rules here. A little more up the wall. You're about ready to touch the wall. Yeah. Turn your head into the right and look at that wall right next to you. I'm scared the shit out of Rennie. <laughs> Don't worry, I've been sitting here. I'm, you, you know, if, yeah. if you're saying that I'm being not cautious enough, then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're fine. For our viewers at home, you'll start to hear a few different voices. We're going to do a quick lunch break for those you of us on watch. Yep. Yeah. So we get 20 meters. So I was, I was telling Mike I want to keep that 
Atalanta at the 20 meter ring, and then we'll yeah. just use Hercules to explore yeah. based on that rather than um, trying to follow the strike of this wall right. because there is so much wall, it's really vertical. How's that wanna, for you, Ronnie? Great. Kay. I want to see the uh, the extent vertically, and then we can choose to back off and go lower if, if need be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't care upper or lower, that's up to the yeah. back row, but. They, we're, they're kind of giving us rain to kind of take a look because we don't we haven't seen the upper wall yet, so we're yeah, gonna go up, up there. Let's come up a now. little bit more and see if it, see if it, uh, The danger of being that close is this, we've had some overhanging cliffs. And yeah, Raj. Yeah, we've been in that situation before, haven't we? Right? Yes, we have indeed. Yeah, that's why I gave that again. I, I did give the instruction. Um, yeah, I just I poo pooed a uh, cinematic thing with Jonathan because we did the ten meters away once and I didn't I didn't dig it. it yeah, crap is not underway at least. Really, you well that's what we yeah, were trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Move ten meters along it. We did it once yeah. and I had Chris move away so we weren't right along it. Yeah, I thought we could get the shot, but yeah, I was waiting for my phone to buzz and Josh to say stop doing that. <laughs> okay, no uh, all right, no the last move the I box, called right? in was uh, was south, um, so Atalanta will swing a little bit more south, but uh, kind of south, south, yeah, yeah kind of been along the strike. Yeah, south. All right, stop south there for now. Uh, it doesn't look like it's getting closer, but I can keep coming up. Yeah, let's come up a little and see Kay. if it falls away. It's good, good to know where the top is. We can always drop back down. Yeah, we want to see kind of the vertical, yeah, vertically so what you, this wall is you looking see like. see it going away now? Yeah. yeah. So if you make a, uh, I usually do a mental note, but I won't be here that long. But, um, 50. Then we can drop down. And then if we do get in trouble and the boat takes a holiday towards the wall, we, you know, know what we, don't, we only have to come up like, you know, 20 meters. Yeah. And then we're in a yeah. If we're in a blow on situation, which, you know, Unlikely, but a little more likely when we're moving the vessel sideways. It's like a staircase there. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of looking that way in the orbit too. Okay, I'm gonna drop back down. You can. Okay. Follow you down. Yeah, you might be far enough away now to drop down yes. next to the wall. Give you another. Um, we're, we keep losing Doppler, so I'm, I'm about to just switch over to USB. To be I had Chris. How he was on USB home. I yeah. we switched back before watch changes, so yeah, yeah. In case we missed it there, I had him switch back. Uh, and at that point, we had DVL and we were monkeying yeah. around with the uh, cinematic filming mode. Did you guys try it after I left, or? We did a photogrammetric model um, uh, pairing, pairing right. with the Norbit. Yeah, we couldn't, with this amount of stuff in the water, we couldn't quite get it close yeah. enough without being really nerve-wracking. I'm going to do another move south. Roger. Bridge now. So, I'll Hi, try Ariel, to stay in front three of zero meters oh, south. There, it starts getting a little closer there. Yeah. Thank you. It, I'll try and stay in front of you. It helps Rennie to figure out which way to move the boat. Yeah. Um, if we're perpendicular to the wall or close to it. Yeah. There, that's about it 17 meters above you. It definitely helps me figure out which way the boat should be going. Rennie does the magic with us. Yeah, but it's good practice for <laughs> any for other people in the seat too. Yeah. It's kind of like that should be the baseline of how we move. Whoa, look at how long this guy is. Oh, wow. Almost long enough to get you nervous, huh? <laughs> it uh, looks like it's had a starfish has been... Uh, yeah. Somebody's been at it, yeah. Macking on it for a while. Yeah, that way then he can just look at your heading and say, okay, move the boat 225 or whatever, right? Yeah. Although we really got to fix this heading offset, it's been about it's about it's 30, 30 degrees. degrees. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know why we haven't done that. I did poke around in the any file a little, looking for a uh, declination setting. Yeah. But to be honest, I was not real thorough. 
Another sidetrack with. I think Trevor's gone down the. He might have some notes somewhere. We could ping him on it, but I think he's gone down that rabbit hole a bit. I tried to do it in my end, and it doesn't do anything. So. Yeah. I should send a note. Yeah. Note to self. Oh, we also only have one laser again. Right here. I'll send a note to the. Uh, Whatever you do today. It might be an offset thing, it could be a calibration thing, I don't yeah. know. Larry, I'm not sure if uh, Dan passed everything along, uh, but we're just kind of moving south um, along these contours and kind of zigzagging up and down. Zigzagging up and down, yeah. So far, it looks like the most interesting stuff is kind of towards the bottom, um, but we haven't really explored all the way up top, so I'm just going going south for now, and we'll decide if we want to ascend or descend. Uh, I think that one one little bit of kilometer stuff was near the bottom. Yeah, so, that's yeah. right. There's like a really, like a, a smoother base, and then above that is the columnar, and then everything right. above that has been a bit mixed. Yeah, and, and you can it's probably not going to change in stratigraphic I wouldn't uh, imagine so, yeah. Order. Uh, but I don't know if up even higher there's another band sure. of it. Sure, uh, yeah. What is that thing? Uh, micro strain? Is that what's in? Atlanta? I think it's a micro strain in Atlanta. Yeah. We have in the chat someone asking if we're recording any sound with the new cameras. We are not recording any sounds. Um, the ROVs actually give off a lot of sound. So if we recorded any sound, all you would really hear is our ROV cameras, or er, our ROVs. That's not completely accurate. No? No, we are. Um, can and have record sound with the uh, oh. camera and the bumper bar. And I have a clip uh, where Trevor is snipping some coral, and you can hear uh, Trevor has that late touch, so you can hear the thrusters. Oh, oh. So oh, the total robotic sound, and then you can hear the manipulator jaws snip as he makes the snip close. So we did an experiment uh, last leg uh, and put the uh, hydrophone you want more each other? from uh, sure. the deep profiler, URI's deep profiler. We put it on Mesobot. And uh, boy, I've been watching the messages go back and forth as Dana and Roland and Val, they're all looking at the spectra of sound. You can hear Drix come over. You can hear the ship come over. Yeah. You can hear all the motors on Mezabot turning on. It's a, it is a cacophony of, uh, of sound there. Yeah. The, uh, the sound of Hercules' uh, hydraulic motor, I think, is just happened to be attenuated and with that particular, because uh, the microphone of the camera is <coughs> inside the housing, so it's, you know, getting somewhat muffled. And the high frequency sounds of the thrusters uh, going, came through. I'm not quite, quite remarkably. Whether Jonathan is actively recording sound on on this, I I, I would say probably not. But uh, I haven't heard that he is. So. Uh, I did just for a test. Uh, <coughs> that was with one of the stereo cameras mounted in the uh, bumper bar. I've had uh, cameras on uh, manipulator arms before, uh, not the built-in ones of Chilling, but the this custom ones that we've hacked together. And you turn the, the microphone on inside the camera and you can hear all sorts of cool stuff. But yeah, mostly mostly the machine working. Uh, we have a question if it, uh, the sound from the ROVs irritates various life that we encounter. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear what that one was. Uh, if we, if any of the sound that the ROVs makes irritates any life that we encounter. I've noticed that, uh, yeah, it, indeed it does. I don't know if it's the... So there's been some discussion uh, with various scientists in the back row whether it's the, including Larry, uh, whether it's the sound that the vehicle makes or the lights or just the pressure wave of Hercules displacing 
that uh, massive volume of water at it as it moves, but the um, the eel pouts get uh, irritated and they'll shake their head and open their mouth. Um, yeah, I know there's been some, some work with uh, using red light subsea on some of these submarines to see if there's a change in behavior on what was normally seen from a, a bright um, ROV or submarine, which would, or submersible, which would um, kind of lead to towards the more bothered by light theory than... Uh, yeah, and, and, and again, this last leg, there were a lot of experiments we did with Mesobot with white lights, no lights, and red lights. Uh, but that's more in the plankton, zooplankton, and the things. Um, although there were some, there were salps and krill and things like that that we were looking at too. Were there any preliminary results about what? The no, it'll it'll take some time for them to uh -huh. actually look look at. Uh, uh, my guess, uh, and this is totally naive, but. I would guess that the thruster would have the, the biggest impact if you get close to something. I know, uh, just observ observing over the years and trying to sneak up on uh, wildlife. Uh, for example, we were uh, studying the halibut. Uh, they have a certain time of year they do their mating kind of thing, and there's just like you know a whole bunch of halibut in one in one place. Um, I think it was halibut, some kind of flatfish. Anyways, um, and a lot of the other wildlife we try and sneak up on, like the uh, the uh, octopus the other night. As soon as we touch the seabed with the ROV, they run hmm. away. So oh, that's interesting. Well, they're feeling the vibration through the seafloor. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times we can get really close, and mm -hmm. you just like you barely touch the ROV, not even hard, and just uh, then as soon as that happens, the fish. Uh, run away. I've seen just the opposite uh, because a lot of things down there because there's no light. Uh, they rely on vibration to find things, find food. They're all food driven. And uh, on one cruise we were using uh, elevators or landers to drop stuff down to the sea floor. And then we'd go and find it to grab whatever off of it uh, we were getting. And it would be covered in crabs. Yeah. So oh wow! Indeed, the crabs are. Yeah, good observation, Dave. Yeah, they're so they're know. like if we could just eat this thing, we would live <laughs> like yeah. kings. Something yeah. fell down here. I like yeah. go and see when we when we deploy yeah. the uh, the drops. Yep. There's yeah. always the crabs. Just like they come a running, they think there's a free meal there. Interesting. I I never made that connection. We get lots of rock caught on those ONC cruises that are enamored with the lights and the vibrations as well. Yeah, we've had the fish. Uh, yeah. Like they'll get, they'll start circling the ROV, yeah. a, a giant school, uh, and it will disrupt our visibility. But they're feeding in the light, so they're doing this. You can see them in the cameras. They're swimming around and around the ROV, and when they swim through in the front where the bulk of the lights are, they're feeding, and then they keep going, and they, it's like this really weird whirlwind of, of fish so the small fish like the anchovies will do it and even the bigger some of the bigger fish like pollock have had those they're attracted to the rov lights like a bug or they're feeding on something they can yeah i don't know if there's something else that's attracted by the lights but the Fish definitely come in and feed in the ROV lights. And so somebody much so where we've had to turn off the lights on one ROV and try and attract them to another one. <laughs> or we've tried to put down flashers or other kind of yeah. lights to lure them away because we were doing a similar to this, uh, but kind of photometrology. So uh, they were so thick we couldn't get accurate cameras of all the fiducials that we had laid along the seabed. Uh, viewers commenting that there's a whole effort around trying to create a zero intrusion ROV or other observation platform with using special cameras with specific light wavelengths uh, that they can't see and that it was utilized, uh, utilized partially by uh, an effort to find the giant squids. Yeah, I think that is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, is that Imbari doing that? Uh, Larry stepped out already. Uh, I know Ambari has uh, done uh, 
some science in, in that area. I'm not sure if it's a giant squid, but certainly for the uh, midwater animals. Uh, a viewer is commenting that the sable fish are notorious for doing that, and I remember them almost ruining some dives because they kept kicking up dust. Yeah, totally. And the ROV pilot gets blamed. <laughs> And it's the fish. I've had my boss kicking my chair. Stop doing that. You're disturbing the visibility. I'm like, it's coming from way over there. It's not me. Look at that. Nice little curly yeah. cue on the... Let's go in there. I think that was a heading change, was it not? Did you change heading? Yeah, it was that? probably. Was I came down a couple meters, Ernie. Oh, that was I don't know. See if it's there on the next week. Yeah. Come on, that'd be cool. <laughs> that can't be natural. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I think it was when I came down a bit. Yeah. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> Boring. <laughs> so I'm find something, something below us. Above us. A little close. Well, let's come up because uh, that's a hard pink wall you got there. And I've just completely destroyed the visibility down here, so. No, no, it was a fish. <laughs> oh, it was me getting a little close and panicking and pulling away from the wall. I was trying to buy you a way out there, Dad. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> We're going to be a little far away there. Do you want me to bump closer to the wall? No. Okay. I think uh, as we come down, it gets closer to us. So yes. as we come up, it gets further away. But we're, we're doing okay here. We can keep moving so. Copy. Or whatever the bearing was there. South-ish. Yeah, I think Rennie said. 180. Yeah, works for me. Bridge, bridge, nav. 30 at 180, please. Yep. <coughs> We're flying around in the dark again, no Norbit, but it looks like it hooks back around towards us a little, so. So that's probably good. Just gonna wanna uh, I think I'm gonna stow that manipulator. Have a craft? Yeah, does can you hit craft for me? Yeah. There you go. No reason for it to be hanging out there if we're not using it. It's just a liability if we get tangled up in our tether or something. You can uh, go porch again if you want, or okay. gauges, whatever. Porch, probably. Because I can keep an eye on the stereo camera. Yeah. So. Uh, maybe we'll drop back down again to see if it comes closer. Okay. I kind of feel like we should be, if we want to see animals, we should be up on the ridge. I don't know what we're going for here.
doesn't really seem to be creeping closer, so. Yeah. Well, we did pop up to the top. There was nothing up there either, so. We did, right? Yeah. Yeah, we did. back up again or I'll come up while you're coming south and just gonna turn my aft light on uh, uh, is anybody familiar with Edith Witter who wrote a book uh, below the edge of darkness uh, viewers commenting that uh, she did a lot of work creating a red light camera to aid in filming bioluminescence. At one point she was involved in a Umbari uh, setup and separately was involved in the expedition that got the first video of a giant squid. Oh, it was Umbari. That's really awesome. I, I will have to look into that book. I, yeah, if you need yeah. to know the name of the book, I am putting it on my wish list. Yeah. I know. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Thank you to the viewer for that recommendation. Let's uh let's live large step ten meters west. Copy that. Just in time for Simon to come back and what'd you do? We'll go look at the top, see if we get some more. Bridge, bridge, nav, one zero, at the end at of your tether two there. seven zero. Yeah, yeah. I can give you five meters back of it if you want. Yep. Copy, thank you. back over to Simon and run away and get some chow. So, you know, Simon, Atalanta is still moving a little south from our previous move. Roger that. Uh, and we're fully on USBL right now. <coughs> copy, copy. Yeah. 80 meters above the, above the seafloor. Mm -hmm. You're also at the very end of your tether right now. I can give you a couple meters back, but... Roger. Oh.
Hey Dan, I'm just kind of jumping in here. Uh, do you guys have any objectives or goals while we're exploring this wall? So the objective and goals are to find some really cool stuff, either really cool lava flows or rock outcroppings or a big clump of coral or fish that are higher biodiversity that we need to do immersive video or photogrammetry on. Okay. Um, so essentially the direction I was sort of given was walk our way down the, you know, down here and at some point give us enough time to climb the wall before we have to ascend. Okay. So right now we're just sort of flying up and down trying to find something cool to look at other than sheer wall. Sounds good. But we're, we're outside the Norbit scan, so we're kind of flying. Right now, Simon's just got to go find stuff. <laughs> cool. Let's have a look. You got your, like, what is that What is that stick that finds water? A diviner. A diviner. You got that, you know, <laughs> to find some cool stuff here? And see what we can see. I think I'll keep the ship moving then, <coughs> south mostly, but then, yeah, maybe just a little closer to the wall. Uh, yeah, it could be like, you probably bring it another five. five meters closer, maybe. Copy. Taylor Ann, we got a question in the chat. It says, can those stalked cridenoids leave page their stalk or are they sedentary? I think the red ones that were up there. Yeah, so they cannot leave their stalk. They are sedentary. Oh yeah. Oh no, yeah. We yeah, no, we we just got that question and um Okay. So yeah, the stock crinoids, yeah, these ones that we see, they unlike other crinoids that we've seen um moving around, these cannot. Um their common name is a sea lily. question in the chat for how far off the wall is Hercules because in the camera it looks like it's just a few feet so yeah I've heard that um, currently our alt altimeter is reading about 55 degree uh, 55 meters um, above the sea floor right now so that's above the sea floor but from the wall in front of you sorry could you have just repeat that, sorry. So, because we're looking, Hercules is looking straight at a wall in front of us. How far are we from the wall, not the floor? Oh, uh, we're around three meters away okay. from the wall right now. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. One of my favorite things to see is starfish, and we've been lucky, and we've seen a couple cute little starfish here and there, but I feel like the starfish population has really decreased over the years. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about starfish wasting disease? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I don't personally know too much about it, um, but I do know that it is a, a, a serious issue um, in the Pisaster sea stars. Yes. From uh, like, uh, yeah, I, I've learned that they kind of turn into like melty goop yeah, almost, it's and they really pass gross away. They turn into. Yeah, yeah. So it's really sad. I don't know if that is something that um, would impact the deep sea sea stars or not. Is that a lobster with the big white? You Ooh, know. Oh, that does look. It good. does. Yeah. Definitely is. Some antennas. crazy antennas on yeah. that. Yeah. It's like a great color. Let's see. Do we want to get a small zoom on that? or uh, If you have time, that'd be great. Yeah, up to everyone if they want to do it. Yeah. I'm happy. Video, can we zoom? Yeah, absolutely. Man, those 
antennas are impressive. It looks like there's one, two, three, there's three pairs, so six total antennae. Yeah, it looks like a shrimp, actually. Is it shrimp? We've zoomed in, yeah. Can you explain how you can tell, like, what is the difference taxon or anatomy-wise between a shrimp and a lobster? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you can, the appendages are very different um, for a lobster. So like we've seen some of these squat lobsters and they have these really long lo claw appendages You guys in front can of move them. on when you uh, need to. Um, okay. Whereas shrimp don't have those. So that's one really easy way to tell them apart. Um, the squat lobsters that we've been seeing in the deep sea, um, they have those really big long claws that kind of stick out in front of them. I um, heard that the squat lobsters are actually crabs. So are they crabs or are they lobsters? It's That's like one question. of those common, you know, naming problems we have. Yeah, like what we call sea stars, starfish. <laughs> yeah. Or, um, yeah, they're actually more closely related to hermit crabs, actually. Um, which, yeah, I did not remember that. Yeah, so it makes sense. They kind of have that a body that looks like a hermit crab without its shell. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, tail is kind of tucked under a mm -hmm. bit like hermit yeah. crabs. Yeah, it's really interesting to watch them swim also, uh, kind of swim backwards. Yeah. <laughs> so the chat is asking if this is a known species of crustacean. So do you yeah, so I'm lo I've been looking in uh, the ID guide for a picture here but I have not seen the uh, scientific name for that specific shrimp we just saw, but that could just be me not looking closely enough. I personally have not seen a that, that gray shrimp. A, I've yeah. seen like red. And it was a pretty good size to it too. Yeah, it could be Munopsidae. Um, that's what I'm seeing here in my guide. See. Yeah, that's that's what I'm gonna go with. I think it might be a Munopsidae municope uh, species. So yeah, the phylum was Arthropoda, subphylum Crustacea. And we have someone in the chat saying nomenclature aside, squat lobsters are always throwing out the peace sign. <laughs> is that another sea cucumber, the headless chicken? It does yeah. look like a headless chicken. It is, an Ipneastes. I always spell that one wrong. <laughs> oh, I don't blame you on that. I'll just stick to calling it headless chicken. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a headless chicken, which is a sea cucumber. So holotherian, it's a swimming sea cucumber. So you kind of yeah. see these more swimming versus are normally what we think of sea cucumbers on the ocean floor. Yeah, normally moving with their, their tube feet, uh, similar to how sea stars move around. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really impressive to see these swim or fly around in the water column. They move a lot quicker than most yeah, flying, sea cucumbers. Flying cucumbers. seems like a better descriptive right? word, even though we're in the water. <laughs> I know, it but does. <laughs> they, don't, they don't seem like they swim, they fly. Yeah. Um, I know there are um, these other sea cucumbers that have a sail on them. Uh, I forget what they're called. But I think they're called the gummy squirrels is the... <laughs> <laughs> is the common name. Um, Man, and, the people yeah. who are naming these headless <laughs> chicken monster, gummy squirrels. <laughs> yeah, we have some uh, really exciting names for, for these, but they're easy to remember. They are. For I sure. mean, I can definitely remember headless chicken monster way yeah. easier than the scientific name. Yeah. You can move along yeah, if you're that. ready. We're still trying to find some cool things for Jonathan to... He do immersion or photogrammetry. He doesn't want to do photogrammetry of a headless chicken monster? It's tough to do, or <laughs> tough to do photogrammetry on moving things. That's true. It uh, looks it pretty like sheer directly below you. It does, yeah. Kind of a silk. Is that that 1467? That same silk we were seeing? That depth. 1467. Maybe not.
Uh, the chat is saying that they'd rather memorize the taxonomic name. Um, I, can't, I don't even, can you help me pronounce the scientific name for headless chicken monster? Yeah, yeah. Anipniastes? Anipniastes, yeah. yeah. Then th to have to Google headless chicken monster again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Or I yeah. think Google headless chicken, I think they Great. might have got some. Yeah. Um, zero, pretty disturbing yeah, imagery. Yeah. Zero nine zero, please. Um, so I'm trying to think of how to pronounce the name of the si the scientific name of the sea cucumber I was mentioning with the sail. So they said someone in the chat said that is Pelagiothuria. Yeah. So there are I think it's Psychocropodidae. Um, yeah, they they're pretty interesting looking. But yeah, they, I don't think they know what they use the sail for. Yeah. Um, but it definitely does kind of look like a squirrel or a, to me it more looks like a, a, a bunny. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it would be helpful to have more common names for some of these. Taylor, Ann, could you talk about how sea cucumbers, Jonathan always likes to hate on the sea cucumbers, but can you talk about how they're important to our marine ecosystems? Yeah, so they do uh, recycle a lot of, uh, um, well, actually, let me let me think about that one for a second, because I'm actually not sure. <laughs> um, from what from I'm the deep sea, I'm not sure if it's what what that answer would be. Yeah, I, from what I've heard for our shallower, like our reefs, right, they kind of suck in sediment, clean out the detritus from that sediment, and then they poop out nice clean sand for us, right, yeah. that they kind of clean out all Great. the dead plants uh, and animals. Three, zero, one, six, I have five. seen that in deep sea cucumbers at um, around over 4,000 meters doing it's doing, doing the, same. Yeah. the same thing, yeah. They do, yeah. So they yeah. they do do the same thing. I'm just not sure how that would be beneficial to the surrounding organisms, but um, yeah, they definitely do. They're detritivores, so they they feed on the sediment. Um, so they will filter out whatever bacteria or uh, detritus is you know edible to them, and then the rest of it just comes out the other end. Um, it could be also, I guess, like the headless chicken monster might be an adaptation because. They're just cleaning the detritus out of the ocean water then. Is that a possibility? That's why they're not on, they're swimming sea cucumbers instead. Yeah, so here it's saying that uh, they make the nutrients that are buried in the sediments available again to other organisms by bringing them to the surface. So that, that makes sense. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, they, they use Bridge their mouth appendages to kind of sift zero, through zero, nine, and zero. pull up that sediment um, that otherwise is undisturbed. Copy, cancel that move. One zero zero nine zero. Copy, thank you. Thank you, Taylor Ann, for joining us. And we are about to welcome back Zach. So we have someone in the chat saying another name for them is Spanish dancers, but Spanish dancers are are actually nudibranchs. So they are a different. Um, they are actually mollusks, where sea cucumbers are holotherians and they are echinoderms. So their Spanish dancers might look similar because they have that like kind of float and flap around in the water column, but they're actually completely separate organisms. A squirt. What is that? Next to the sea pen. Yeah, next to the sea pen. Yeah. yeah. All right, and we have a student asking about how hot do deep sea vents get? So we saw some deep sea vents um, yesterday, but they weren't actually venting yet. So uh, it's not active right now, but it's been recorded that deep sea vents can actually reach over 400 degrees Celsius. So that is very hot that they've even had um, melted temperature probes before. Simon, I think last time you were talking about driving an ROV around. Uh, yeah, events, so right? up in uh, off the coast of Vancouver, around the Juan de Fuca 
plate, um, the deep sea vents there. We recorded temperatures around 336 degrees uh, Celsius. And we had to recover some instrumentation that was lost in a, in a rock slide in the, on the vent. And we had some partially melted uh, rubber protection on the, on the side of the RV when we recovered it. Wow. It was, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it gets pretty warm. But they do vary in temperature even in uh, vent systems with multiple vents uh, around Explorer and, uh, and that kind of area. There was like 11 vents in the same area and they ranged in temperature from around 205 range, Celsius range to around now. 310 Three within kind of the same vent system. So. Please. Yeah. Three zero at one six five. Copy, thank you. As I say, during our uh, ONC cruise, some of the instrumentation that came up at the hydrothermal vents had actually melted through the cables yep. connected, and it's just that's yeah, really really interesting to kind of see that because they leave the, behind the deposit of the mineral as well on top of it. It is. I got some some rock at home that's uh, around a year old because it came off a of bars that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was in that in that rock slide and uh, yeah it's full of iron pyrite and it's yeah pretty spectacular to look at the whole area around there kind of glitters like starlight when you come in with the the rov yeah. and the lights because of the amount of iron pyrite that's deposited in the rock in that that area it's they call it the grotto and it's stunning <laughs> <laughs> yeah And then we have another question in the chat asking, how many new sea creatures are discovered in the deep sea every year? Dan, do you have an estimate? What do you think? How many deep sea creatures are discovered? I'm getting towards this. I would say around a thousand. Okay. Zach, what do you say? I honestly have no idea. I've never. <laughs> I never looked it up. I mean, I'd say more and more as we're exploring more, but um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I just was looking it up, and there's this, apparently this analysis that came out not too long ago, and it estimates that there are some 5,000 sea animals completely new to science. So um, this is just what? an estimate. It's something that's really hard to say. We've only mapped about 25% of our ocean floor, so a lot of it's unmapped. And so there's, it's a really hard thing to put a number on, and whatever we, um, and research we have would be a complete estimate based on. So who knows, maybe you can be a future researcher and discover new species. Jonathan, can you talk about any new species that have been discovered by Nautilus? I am no expert on that. Um, I know that we do discover a great deal of cryptic species, so something that when we zoom in, um, a scientist ashore will be like, hmm, could be the same thing, but is could not be. And I think that a great deal of species like that are, are uh, discovered after genetic analyses. So, a, I'm sorry, a cryptic species is something that looks very similar to something else, but in fact is very different. Um, so I'm sure that that happens a great deal. Um, we last year discovered a species of Solumbula, um, which is a really cool I think it's a single polypy thing. You can look it up on our YouTube. I think I called it Medusa's something. Um, that uh, I think only one or two has ever been found, and there was the open possibility that this was a brand new one, a brand new species, given its distance from other recorded spots. Um, yeah, so I think it happens quite a bit, but um, I'm, I can't think of any particular one from recent known. Actually, 13 species from Galapagos were dis described wow. um, from our expedition. I'm not sure how long ago that was. That recently came out. Back All the from, expeditions are starting to blur together for you? Well, I think that it was... Well, look at I this one. It's like... 
Oh, another one, bag of Cheetos. Completely uh, transparent. Yeah. Those are cool. There you go, guys, sea cucumber. Neat. Since this one is swimming, is this one a more acceptable sea cucumber for you? Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, I mean, I appreciate anything that kind of gracefully floats through the water like this. Its entire entrail is just visible. <laughs> Bridge, bridge, nav, three zero at one eight five, please. Copy. It's a good sunset. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we always get a, we always miss the sunset in here <laughs> on this watch. Yeah. Oh yeah, see, there's the only single polyp sea pen nearly ever. It was a sea pen, yeah. So are we still just follow it? We're going to follow this rock wall to infinity and beyond? Until something cool comes. All right, here we go. Spirit of exploration right here. It's a good day. He's singing. Everything's working. <laughs> yeah, sir, everything's working. Actually, I mean, I'm not afraid to admit it, so we always run into problems, especially when you're engineering new systems like this. Um, if folks are keen-eyed, they'll see that in the right hand, the lower right-hand uh, camera is our uh, starboard side camera, and you see it's kind of the rectilinear image, which means that it's not the circular fisheye like the left-hand side, but it's uh, kind of, it uses the full frame. Um, but the keen eye among you might see that I have very dark edges around that, um, around the frame this time, it's kind of circled out. And that's because, for whatever reason, I've lost communication with the lens. Um, and it probably has to do with the little zoom ring that, that we've engineered on the inside of it, um, which means that the lens is automatically stopped down all the way to f22 which is not ideal. Uh, it's, it basically has, has cut a bunch of light out. Um, that's why everything appears to be like really sharply in focus and there's a large amount of what's called vignetting um, around the edges. So it's still a very usable image for photogrammetry, but you just kind of check off these little things and try to fix the bugs uh, from the engineering standpoint um, as, you, as you run across them when you're, when you're validating a new system like this. It is a new system. This yeah. is what we're here for. Yep. Johan, uh, someone in the chat is asking, how high is this sea wall that we're, we're going up from the bottom to the top? Um, we think it's about a thousand feet or about 300 meters. So a very large wall. It the largest is. I've ever seen underwater at least. Did you want to get a photogrammetry all the way up, Jonathan, at some point? I mean, I would love to see what's on top, but... Here's some more volcanic stuff. Yeah. What was the what was the ideal depth of those other corals? 400 meters, or... That we saw them when the density of corals at about 400 meters depth? The one off yeah. Kona? Yeah. Yeah, I think Wasn't around that there. about, about yeah, 400? Yeah, around 400. What's our depth now? Uh, one four eight six. Oh, about a thousand off. <laughs> well, let's see if this, see how high this seamount goes. I have a question in the chat for crew members who have been on many trips on Nautilus. What are your favorite type of expeditions? So, Dave, let's start over with you. What's your favorite type of expedition? Oh, gosh. Um, this kind where we're diving with ROVs. 
Um, last uh, last time we were out, uh, I've been out for the last five weeks, uh, but uh, the first part of, uh, of my time out here a month ago, we had uh, three different vehicles on board, but uh, they were all autonomous vehicles. Uh, and that's interesting, but from uh, my standpoint, from the video standpoint, uh, we don't have real-time video from those devices. Uh, and so we shoot the, the uh, deck cameras, record the deck cameras when uh, they're going off the ship, coming back on the ship, uh, that kind of thing. But there's nothing much in between, so it gets kind of boring. Uh, I like doing this kind of stuff where we're, doing, where we're diving every day, seeing interesting stuff. And Mike, you've been on a couple expeditions. Just what's, one or two. So what's your kind of favorite? It really depends on what I'm doing for that expedition. So um, if I get to do some of the ROV piloting um, and technician work and stuff, I really enjoy getting a chance to work on the ROVs. Um, I will say that some of the other expeditions such as ONC or the tech challenge that we did really kind of offer up a um, offer up a variety of different instrumentations and vehicles that we get to do overboarding as a uh, deck chief so it allows us to kind of exercise our our uh, troubleshooting process and thought process for rigging uh, and putting vehicles over safely and recovering them so I like, like both of them equally as well. But I will say that any of the wreck dives are, are really awesome. Are you looking forward to our submarine dives coming up here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. And Johan, is this your first expedition or you have been on other ones? I can't remember. This is my first expedition with Nautilus, but my fourth overall. And uh, so what kind of expeditions do you like? Does it differ for you for the navigation perspective? Uh, this is actually my first time working as a navigator in any sense. So uh, I can't really speak <laughs> to that from experience. Um, but yeah, on my other uh, cruises, I've been more on the science side. And uh, those have all kind of been hydrothermal vent cruises, which are pretty cool. Uh, and a lot more science focused, so taking samples and temperature readings and uh, deploying different sensors and all that kind of stuff. And I found that to be pretty exciting. So, uh, Johan, this is Dan. Um, just trying to plan out the rest of the dive. We got to be back up at 8 o'clock. Um, I know they want to scale the wall. Uh, what time? You know, what time should we start the scale of the wall? Yeah, so if we were to ascend from this depth, it would take about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, if we expect the wall to be, let me look at the depth we have recorded for this top of it. Um, about 11.50 meters. Let me do a little math and I'll get back to you. All right, I'm just trying to, you know, get a plan. Yeah, definitely. So I have a student of mine asking what our favorite animal is that we've seen on this expedition so far. So I think, let's see. What has been my favorite? The piglet squid was pretty cute. So I like the piglet squid. Dan, how about you? Uh, my favorite was the gulper eel. The gulp? Oh, I forgot about the gulper eel. But the octopus eel. was like a close second, oh. maybe first. Tie. I might have to switch mine to the gulper eel and have the piglet squid as second. Zach, how about you? What has been your favorite? Bridge, bridge now. Uh, zero, you guys have two, both zero, taken zero, the top. Zero, I mean, the ray was cool, though, too. Um, oh, that yeah, six scale yeah. ray, yeah, that was really cool to see it swimming, especially that way. Um, but probably the piglet squid. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Mike, what's the coolest thing or species you have seen on Hercules excursions? Hercules excursions. Ooh. Coolest thing I've seen? Um... 
I, I still enjoy seeing all the sharks that we come across down here, as well as the uh, tripod fish. Oh yeah. And that they're, the predators down here are very, their, their methods for hunting are very interesting. And so kind of seeing those in action is, uh, is where my interests lie. And Dave, how about you? What's been the coolest thing? We'll open this up to all Hercules. All, all oh. time? All yeah. time. Uh, Dumbo octopus. Oh, yeah. Grimpetuthus. But any octopus, really. I like octopus. Mm -hmm. um, and Dan, here's a question for you. Um, what Japanese subs are we diving on? And is it proprietary until tomorrow? So can we share the names of where we're diving? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. So I <laughs> prefer not to comment at this point. <laughs> So stay tuned, you'll just have to watch in with us tomorrow. There are certain protocols we have to follow when we're diving on wrecks, and we do want to keep the locations of our dives so that people don't sca or scavenge, right? Can you talk more about that, Dan? The need of protecting ship locations. Um, I'm not, this is not what I normally do, so <laughs> I don't really know the answer to those questions. Um, uh, so I just, wait, I just follow instructions. <laughs> so Dan, we'll update. Um, from the top of this seamount, if we were to send her out now, we'd be about 1,200 meters. The further we go, it would be just 10 or 20 meters shallower than that. Um, so that means that the uh, wall itself is usually, or it maintains about 300 meters in height, top to bottom from where we are. Uh, from the surface ascending there, it would be about an hour, which means we have almost an hour to get up there. So do you think, you think we should leave now and head up or stay down for a little while? What's your recommendation? I think we have a little more time. Okay. to wiggle around, but we could start meandering that way. Yeah. We never know what we're going to see at the top. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got yeah. another headless chicken. Yeah, just this place is loaded with them. I would say, Simon, if you want to, you know, if you feel like there's something that you want to head up for, we can slowly make our way up or, you know, just kind of follow anything interesting. Yeah, I feel if we... Um, if we start coming up, we don't know what we're going to see on the way up and give us more time on uh, yeah. any opportunistic stuff we see. If we just ascend with just enough time, if we see something interesting, we may miss it. Uh, so, yeah, I, my feeling is to start the ascent if, if that's what everyone else wants. I'd say go for it. All right, roger that. Let's start now. Ascent of the wall. And then, Zach, I have a question in the chat for you. Simon, are you going to go mm -hmm. kind of straight at it and up? Or kind of come along? Yeah, I can come, I can come slightly oblique. Yeah, we okay. can, yeah, can kind of go like that. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. So, Zach, what yeah. is... Do animals from the deep in the ocean migrate to? <laughs> Bridge, bridge now. Um, depends zero, what you're talking about. Two, two, um, there's five, definitely please. what's known as the vertical migration um, that's happening Coming at night. Um, things such as squids and stuff are are just kind of migrating up towards the surface um, to feed more. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's many species that, that have no need to leave. Um, obviously, there's a lot of benthic creatures as well. Um, but I think that's a, a fairly species-specific um, question in terms of, yeah, do they do they do that? Again, we kind of talked about this a couple of times, but um, if it's worth it energetically, then, then they're going to do it. If it's not, you know, it's not something they've evolved to do. And a lot of these creatures down here are, are things that have evolved to survive in this environment or, yeah, evolve certain behaviors which have allowed them to, you know, have that energy to swim up and down and whatnot. So, yeah, it really depends. And then someone is asking if we've seen China cops or comb jellies on this expedition yet. We have not seen any China cops. We have seen several goose fish, which China cops is an angler fish and goose fish is an angler fish as well. 
and comb jellies. I think yeah. there might have been a couple flow I've by. definitely seen a couple of tina yeah, falls around. Yeah, we've definitely yeah. seen a couple here and there. Yeah. Um, and then I have another question asking about internships on expeditions. Yes, we do have internships. Zach is our science internship. You want to talk mm -hmm. about the internship process a bit, Zach? Yeah, so um, each year there there's an application, open application for uh, various disciplines within the program. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in the data logger science position where I, I'm with the science team and it's our role uh, this this excursion is a little different because we're doing so much um, new technology kind of with the camera system. So on this excursion, my duties have been the data logger up here during the dives, which is, is consistent with all cruises. And then um, the science team is responsible for, for making the photogrammetry, so helping with that. Um, typically, though, a lot of our work would be after the dive, um, working up the samples in the wet lab and processing them and making sure they are all... Uh, documented accurately so we can analyze them further and send them off to where they need to be. Um, so yeah, that there, there's an application for sure. Um, definitely take a look at that on the website. Um, get it in sooner than later. Don't wait to the last minute. <laughs> um, but we've all been there if you do. But yeah, otherwise there's also uh, the ROV interns. There's the um, navigator interns. And am I forgetting one? Video. Yeah. Video. Thank you. Video yeah. intern. I knew there was another one. <laughs> yeah. So, so this cruise, yeah, we have an intern for every every discipline. And um, yeah, it's really awesome. They really kind of take you under their wings and, and let you learn as much as you want to learn. Um, and also, um, they, yeah, they're, they, they, really, they really guide you in the right direction. It's been an awesome um, experience for me so far. And I feel like I've learned a lot and also been able to, you know, feel like you're contributing at the same time. And they're paid internships as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They are paid. So uh, for more information about internships, you can go visit our website, nautiluslive.org. And you can go under the education tab and click on That's students, cool. and they'll tell you about oh, the yeah. internship program. Yeah. And then I have um, another Ray another question. Now, two zero at two three five, please. I have another question in the chat asking, what is the deepest Nautilus cruise crew has ever dove for um, with our ROVs? So I know Hercules max depth is 4,000 meters, and um, Atalanta and Argus can go down to 6,000 meters, and Little Herc can go that deep too. But does anyone know what the deepest dive ever that OET has ever done? So I don't think anyone really knows what is. We've done a lot of dives. So I bet there's someone, uh, a Nautilus avid fan and watcher that might be able to fill it in for us in the chat on what the, long, so on the, the deepest dive is. On the last cruise that we were out on, we were diving on the uh, Japanese and American aircraft carriers uh, from the Battle of Midway. Uh, we mm -hmm. were down about 5,700 meters with uh, uh, Atalanta only. Yeah, so pushing that limit there. Yeah. So then another question is related to that depth one is, was there any um, different animals in that area compared to this one? So each ecosystem is different, I think. So here we have these kind of columnar basalt formations versus deeper ocean and um, hydrothermal vents and you get and just also location wise those ones are out further in the northwest hawaiian islands that we did the dive from previous expedition so all of those can change the type of animals some you see coral predation there by a sea star oh yeah you can see the star still on it as well And then, Zach, someone's asking, what is vertical migration, and why would they only come up at night? Um, so it's it's a it's a trade-off, um, really. So the it's a lot of the, kind of the plankton things that will will come up at night. 
um, to absorb. There's a lot more nutrients up at the surface, um, so they come up at night where there's where there's less predators during the night than there is during the day. Um, but and then things are going to follow that plankton, right? So it's it's a trade-off in the sense of you're spending energy to, in hopes that you'll go get a lot more up there and hoping that at night there's less predation so you'll be able to successfully complete that migration and back. Um, yeah, that's that's really what it is though. Is it for the, the creatures that do those mig migrations, do they suffer any major consequences of going through the oxygen minimum zones? That kind of thing. Um, I'm, I think that's part of the challenge for a lot of them, yeah, is, is just yeah adapting to that and, and getting through those. Um, yeah, I, I don't know specifically anyone, you know, what, what how they've evolved to get through those or whatnot, but... Um, and they're, I'm, they're not probably coming up, you know, from necessarily thousands of meters all the time. Um, Range, bridge net, but, yeah. two zero at two three five, please. And then we have a question asking, how is the underwater communities in Hawaii faring in terms of climate change effects? And are they doing okay? Or are there noticeable declines in populations? And so I think the beauty of these models is that scientists are going to be able to look at the level of detail in these images and be able to do assessments like that and we can kind of monitor and see the changes. Um, so it's not something that I can talk towards but hopefully scientists will be able to use this and be able to conduct f further research on it. Zach, do you have anything you want to add on that? Uh, yeah, I mean there's a, there's a lot of uh, surveys going on in the near shore environment too, keeping track of that. You'll, you'll probably be seeing it in the surface waters more in the deep waters. You know, yeah. they're, they're much more susceptible to change. Um, and there's, yeah, a lot of monitoring, a lot of photogrammetry, a lot of just surveys going on to, to kind of keep track of that. Um, we, you know, we have sensors in the water, all these different instruments that are there to, to monitor things over time. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's one of those too early to tell. We we fortunately didn't go through the similar heat wave that the Florida and that area went through this year at the 100 degree water over multiple days or whatever that ended up being. But, Can you repeat with that? I um, couldn't hear it. Sorry to, on, sorry to interrupt for a second. Uh, are we good? Do you think we'll be able to get above this before I think so. we get there? Okay. Yeah, just keep an eye on it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm slowly coming up with Simon, so. Copy. Yeah. yeah. Just started getting closer and closer. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's gonna... And then I have someone asking if I've had any scares while on the expedition or what the scariest thing that has happened to me. And I don't think I've had any scares per se on this expedition, but I think the ROVs um, pilots might have a little bit different view to share on that. Um, would you guys like to talk about your personal scares that you've had? Here on Nautilus, I think we've been, <laughs> <laughs> we've been pretty... Flying in the dark was a was definitely a challenge. I wouldn't say As it was necessarily scary. We kind of we kind of keep within very defined parameters and uh, to try and mitigate any kind of yeah. scares and surprises. We've got plenty of instrument instrumentation on board to give us advanced warnings of you know things that are coming up that we can't actually see through the cameras. So. Yeah, we have a little bit more information than you can uh, you can see visually here with our sonars and uh, navigation systems and the Norbic scans that are going on all the time. So, yeah, we try and minimize the surprises. We don't like those too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say people at 3 a.m. coming out of different hidey holes has been the scariest <laughs> thing. <laughs> All right, and I have another comment asking about Little Herc. So Little Herc is another one of our ROVs. It's smaller than Hercules, hence the name Little Herc. And I believe- There's a fly trap in enemy. Yeah, a pretty big one too. Yeah. And I believe Little Herc does not quite have the sam uh, the ability for sampling that Hercules does, but Little Herc can go down to 6,000 meters. Mike, come off a little bit. Yeah. Bridge, bridge, nav, one zero at zero nine zero, please. Yeah. Yeah. 
Little Herc is just a camera platform. It uh, doesn't have any manipulators, uh, very little instrumentation. Uh, it's basically just uh, to go down and look at stuff. And then the Herc, uh, the chat is reminding us about Atlanta getting stuck in the fishing line as a scare. And yes, that did happen, but that was also on another shift. So we we weren't scared by it, I guess, but it was definitely a tense situation, I would say, but our ROV pilots handled it beautifully. We're gonna increase our Delta, Roger. And then so, we so we're getting a little bit closer. Yeah. It looks like it's starting to shift back off. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Uh, moving on zero nine zero, I believe. And uh, yeah, you should start coming back fairly shortly. Yep. Okay. Yeah, looks like it's going to start heading, uh, sloping yeah. off. Mm -hmm. Okay, that. Okay. And then we have a question in the chat asking what it would take to get uh, Dr. Ballard to extend this dive. And I don't think he will extend this dive because we have to make the transit over to Oahu. So we are limited on time for us to get ready for our other dives. I'm sure he's open to bribes though. <laughs> And then I have another one asking if the Armin blobfish is researched by Nautilus or the Nadoff pufferfish. And I don't think we have any specific expedition looking at specific species of fish. I know there was ones looking at coral biodiversity, but I think a lot of it is just seeing what we see and studying the ecosystems and the animals we come across. but we do work with a wide range of onshore and scientists who also come onto the ship as well. Another question is if there's a limit to how long HERC can dive for in terms of where on the vehicle system. Has HERC dived for more than 24 hours? So Mike and Simon, I'm gonna throw that over to you. Um, I believe so, yes. Yeah. 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 Herc is dove longer than 24 hours. Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, I think 36 is the max? About 36 is what yeah. the max has been, but theoretically uh, it can go much longer than that. Uh, we work in uh, uh, on 24 hour watches, uh, four on and four off. Uh, this is the eight to four watch, and then there's another watch that comes on after us, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, I mean four to eight watch, sorry. Uh, gave us an eight hour watch there instead. Um, but yeah, we can work around the clock and as long as the uh, ROV is uh, healthy and we haven't filled up all the sample boxes. Uh, when we're doing normal ROV work uh, rather than just camera work, uh, we're taking rock samples, we're taking uh, coral samples, uh, that kind of stuff. And eventually we fill up the sample boxes and don't have any place to put anything, uh, that kind of thing. So that's usually the limiting factor. Uh, but things do go wrong occasionally. Uh, there'll be a problem on the ROV and we have to come back uh, and get it on deck and fix it and send it back out again. But theoretically, uh, her can go down and stay down as long as uh, uh, science requires it or as long as we need to. My personal record for an ROV dive is 34 days. So wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mike and Simon, here's another question the chat has specifically for you. How do you do your job as pilots? Is it hard? How much different controllers are there? And was there a school or class you need to take in order to learn? Um, so yeah, we have, um, currently I can see at least three, maybe four controllers in front of me right now. So I have the main pilot one uh, with a, a joystick that controls uh, my side-to-side, -side, my turning, my up-and-down movements. As uh, seen here on uh, Sat V3. 
Okay, and uh, along with that, there's several buttons on there for uh, camera pan and tilt, for some of the drawer extensions, and uh, auto functions that I can in engage. We also have what looks like a little gaming controller, if you can see that off to the side. That's a controller that specifically for one of the cameras that gives us various preset views. And then to my left, I have the uh, controller. So to give the viewers feedback, you're looking at satellite feed Copy, three. That is um, Simon in the middle driving Hercules. And then to the left, you have Mike, who is piloting Atalanta. Yeah. Also, just off to my to my left, I have yes. a, con a controller that's specifically for the uh, the seven function manipulator. So that's a, a separate controller again, which Mike's handily pointing to. And then a little off to my right, there's another little box controller there that I can use to uh, change the range and uh, orientation of the sonar, etc. Along with uh, the screen in front of me that has multiple uh, layers of information where I can turn off lights on and off and that's all uh, either touch screen or mouse controlled. So we have a lot to look at. Uh, myself personally, I did not attend a school as such for RVing. I went straight in uh, on my the back basis of my technical prior technical knowledge into the industry and learnt flying as I as I went. Um, I attended like a, a two week familiarization to learn the basics of uh, of RVing and the uh, the industry I was going into. But uh, all my piloting was uh, taught to me on the job. And then. Uh yeah, for Atalanta, I have uh, the joystick that you can see my hand on uh, to the left of Simon, uh, and that controls the winch going up and down, which uh, controls Atalanta going up and down. I have uh, a mouse uh, that I use concurrently uh, to also change the heading of Atalanta to keep Hercules in focus. I have another mouse um, to change camera angles to check gauges. I have a myriad of screens up here that I'm constantly looking at, and then I have my own um, my own uh, page in front of me right now that has all the a lot of the controls for Atalanta. And then on my far left next to Dave, uh, Dave lets me play with the zoom uh, for Atalanta's camera. So, uh, and then as far as piloting goes, I learned ROV piloting on the ship. Um, I have had some uh, AUV uh, and ASV piloting beforehand uh, through other programs, um, but yeah, uh, no no proper schooling for a specific ROV. I think my favorite thing about that view from you guys above is you have all the the machines and buttons, and then Johan's over there with just a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> but, <And> Johan's, <laughs> but Johan's doing a very important job on the communication between the ship movements and keeping track and making sure we don't run into anything. So thank you, Johan. Of course. <laughs> Two keyboards, five screens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Simon, did you say your longest ROV drive or dive was 34 days? Is that 34 what you said? days, that's correct, yeah. That is can, can you tell us what that was about? Um, so we were working down in Brazil for um, an oil company down there, and they had a, an oil well that was forming um, methane hydrate ice around some of the valves. Uh. So we were sent down to monitor the buildup or dissipation of that methane hydrate ice uh, while they did various tests and procedures from a, from a platform. Gotcha. So, yeah, it wasn't a very interesting dive. It was <laughs> <laughs> holding yeah. position for 34 holding days. Holding <laughs> position for 34 days. <laughs> Literally, we uh, we had the two uh, robotic arms and we held on with those and yeah, turned uh, wow. turned most of the, anything off that we didn't need. And so yeah. Other than that, I've done done dives that have been, you know, a week and things like that. You know, where we don't need to need to come up if we're doing subsea construction. And, Everything comes down from the surface on cranes, and yeah, yeah, we can. As long as we have the crew and the fuel on board and a serviceable ROV, it can stay down ad infinitum. So the chat wants to know what happened to Rennie's cookie. <laughs> it's not. I don't. Is it still up there? 
We didn't see it on the overhead oh, no, view. that's long gone. That's long gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. We noted he was muted on SPL for a while. Then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we did get brought some uh, Halloween candy, though. So some of us are chomping away on some Halloween candy. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> and then uh, there's another question asking, asking why is the mission control room always so dark? Are there lights in the room? And yes, there's lights. We actually have red lights on. And that's to kind of help with our night vision, make the Grange, screens. Grange now, two zero at two seven zero. Make the screens a little easier for us to read and see those details and stuff on them. So it's just to protect our, I guess, night vision almost in a way. Anyone have anything else they want to add to that? Um, the external lights and uh, lights in general would put a glare up on the screen when we're getting, as we're piloting and need to be able to see what's going on. Yeah. Johan, they want to know if you also have a fidget spinner over there. I have three, I think, <laughs> right now. <laughs> I feel like more show up every watch. <laughs> There's at least another three down in the data lab. There's a lot oh, in yeah. the data and lab. They, and then yeah. they, they get swapped around. They're so helpful, though. <laughs> Absolutely. It's something I, I forgot that I enjoyed so much. I need to get more. Is that a tripod fish? Ooh. Hard to tell from this angle. Looks like it, that's their general uh, MO, is to, to just sit there still and wait for something to come in front of them they can eat. Zach, do you want to talk about why they're called a tripod fish? I think I Sorry, I had some candy, candy stuck in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they, they have modified um, peckfins, I believe is what it is, um, that they use to, to prop up on. And basically, they'll they'll sit like their little tripod. Um, yeah, I haven't seen one yet this whole excursion, though, so it'd be pretty cool if this is on. Simon, I'm going to switch you back to USBL. Is that what it is, Dave? Is it the peckfins? Out of the modified ones? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Or not is really my area of expertise. Is it pec fins so. or pelvic fins? I don't know. I think got us. I want to say pec fins, but I'll, I'll check that. They want to know if your fidget spinners, if you guys have the poppets. Fidget spinners. A lot of interest in the fidget spinners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, they're not. Uh, two of them up here are actually ones that I believe were 3D printed on the ship. Oh, that's cool. 3D printed fidget spinners. And then the ball bearing uh, rotational portion in the middle just kind of inserted and glued in. But, yeah. No poppets, unfortunately. And then we have a question asking if um, creatures have ever been scared by Hercules, this big, loud, shiny, bright um, thing <laughs> in the water. And I think we actually, so as you can tell, sometimes we zoom in. So we do try to keep some distance from it, but sometimes some animals do swim off. So hard to tell. Sometimes I think they're swim or scared some of them might just, yeah, swim off. They're starting to get out. So is that I think uh, your tether? I'll stop yeah, and right as you hook in. I think sometimes they have, you know, we're moving around them and they get a little bit of the thrust to wash that they encounter and they react to the movement of the water. More so than the, the sound RV. and More light. Yeah, they, they seem to be pretty uh, at ease with how this noisy, big, bright thing comes up, up on them. I have 
accidentally scared the excrement out of the sea pig <laughs> when I uh, was flying hurt. Uh, zoomed in all nice and beautiful. Dave had it perfectly in shot and, and then it, yeah, was not happy. <laughs> Well, one of the crew members actually popped out of me at um, the stairwells when I was coming up the stairs and gave me, I guess someone asked my fright, so I guess that's my fright right there, is someone popping out of me as I go up the stairs. Some people in the chat are thinking that instead of a tripod fish, that might be a lizard fish, and saying it's much meaner and scarier looking than tripod fish. Yeah, it very well could be. Um, yeah, they put, look fairly similar from a distance, especially, and yeah, could be. Now they want a marketing campaign of 3D printed Nautilus fidget spinners. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on Sketchfab? <laughs> Probably took it off Sketchfab to make them. <laughs> Probably, yeah. question asking if we have a doctor on board to help in case of emergencies. Dave, can you talk about that? Uh, we have a lot of doctors, uh, a lot of people with doctorates, usually on, uh, on board the ship, but medical doctors usually not. Uh, we do have a medical officer on board, at least one of the ship's crew, uh, the professional crew, is uh, designated as the medical officer and has training. Uh, we have a hospital room on board. Uh, and uh, we have access to uh, teledoc uh, services uh, in case of somebody uh, injured or coming down with something. Uh, so, no real doctors, but we do have medical officers. And Mike is an EMT, so if something happens, I'm calling for Mike. <laughs> <laughs> really good at sticking people with needles. Right. Mike is a man of many talents, including uh, knitting. <laughs> Speaking of needles. Yep. <laughs> Currently carrying my knitting project in my pocket. Rachel joining us. Hi, Rachel. Howdy, everyone. How are you? Good. I feel like we haven't been catching you as much on these watch lately. It's been a busy couple days. Yeah. You want to give us an update on your work and how things are going? Um, yeah. So today was mostly a lot of getting ready for the, the sub dives tomorrow. Uh, I know from the DE side, you know, we talked a little bit about protocols for, you know, like cultural, I guess what we call underwater cultural heritage sites and what are the non-disclosures. Uh, so since DE is uh, data engineering is the department, we're actually like the, the scribes of the vessel, if you think of it like that. Uh, so we manage all the recording and the, the live data. So most of the actual, you know, the execution of those policies to protect um, shipwreck sites where, you know, people have, uh, you know, like died during the, when the ship went down. Um, so most of the actual, like, you know, execution uh, of those policies uh, falls to us. So there's, there's a lot of places where, you know, all the, the live streaming, the website data, that all needs to be secured in different locations. And we also have, uh, like, physical, you know, for uh, the science party, we actually make regular hard drives like you, you know kind of like you'd get off Amazon um, so you know we got to be careful about um, 
it's almost like a like a need to know basis. You know, we have a lot of really high precision navigation on board, but uh, we want to make sure that you know anything where we have uh, rec data that you know it's only being people given to people who have an absolute justifiable need to know. Um, so there's a lot of work getting ready for that. We are actually, uh, you've been hearing all of our, uh, all of our science parties been on board in the back row for this, but uh, for the next couple days, we'll have folks who will be remotely participating from shore. So a lot of the last couple days has been uh, making sure all those systems work and realistically like fixing a lot of that stuff. Um, fortunately, we got the last you know, major problems with the remote science participation fixed today. Um, so yeah, I think when I first came back up here uh, to relieve Jonathan, I kind of like stared at the monitor for a little <laughs> bit, kind of like, you know, Needed distant. to decompress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Well, thank you for the update, Rachel. Um, and then, Simon and Mike, uh, we have a question asking what distance does Atalanta normally stay from Hercules? <laughs> <laughs> Depends <laughs> on the shot. <laughs> We've been playing around with that distance a lot more this expedition, I feel, than, than is normal. Is that correct? Yeah, we've had some, uh, some instances where we wanted to get a particular uh, view or use uh, Atalanta for lighting purposes, so we're getting a little closer, uh, which we've kind of outside the normal parameters but with the banality of the sea that we've had the conditions have been very good sea currents have been very mild so we've been very fortunate with that that we can do that but we generally maintain you know around a 10 meter offset uh, vertically and then uh, Adela uh, Hercules will has a obviously a 30 meter tether so we can't get too far away from uh, from Atlanta without pulling it around so we'll generally keep with, within a 20 meter circle of the, the footprint of Atlanta and you know a 10 meter ish separation between the, uh, between the two vehicles in the vertical. But if we get closer to At Atlanta, then we'll bring Atlanta up uh, vertically to you know make, maybe increase that to 20 meters if it's uh, we're more directly underneath, just to manage the tether and make sure that we don't uh, introduce any loops and knots that we don't want there. So, yeah, it's all about just managing that uh, link between the two of us, keeping the distance so we're not putting it under too much strain or getting it too slack. So it's a lot of management, a lot of movement. You see Mike's hands if it's uh, on the video feed, reaching for the uh, for the winch controls quite regularly just to move up and down as I, I uh, <laughs> move up and down the the face of this sea mount, this uh, yeah this cliff wall. Thank you. And yes, our medical officer on board is Officer Martina. And uh, we have a question asking if we've ever had a medical emergency on board. Now, I can't talk about the history of OET because I haven't been here, but we have not had any on this expedition so far. Knock on wood. And then another question is, when you guys see an injured sea animal, what do we do to help it? And or if do we help it in any way? And we do not, because that is part of the circle of life. So um, sometimes you, nature, like we saw a one-eyed goose fish the other day, and there's nothing we can really do to help it. And it seemed fine on its own, so who are we to um, put ourselves into that and um, yeah, it sometimes might become food source for another animal. Rachel, you want to add into that? Well, I was going to say too, I mean, because logistically, you know, most of the work we do is, is deep submergence. So, yeah. you know, even if we were going to try and, and rescue a creature, you know, the, the issue is if we find it at a thousand meters, we bring it up to surface level, the, the change in ambient pressure would be not good for it. Yeah, it'd, it'd kill it. <laughs> yeah. It'd be worse off if we try to help. That, and I don't think we're uh, hospitals set up for surgical procedures <laughs> on invertebrate sea animals. I did work at, uh, I did a internship when I was in college at Long Beach Aquarium, oh. and they had performed um, brain surgery on one of their moray eels. So kind of cool for a 
hot second there is debating on doing marine animal veterinary in my career pathway. So are those uh, the marine successful eel? surgery? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you the eel is still alive. It had a, you could see kind of a little divot in its skull, but it completely healed. Uh, it was. I think that I saw it when it was 10 years post-surgery, and it was still going strong. Wow. Yeah. What, um, what kind of insurance did it have? <laughs> Better insurance than I do as a teacher. Oh, wow. I'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are the moray eels, are those like a like a shallow water species, like yeah, low pressure? Moray, or yeah. Uh, seen those in the Mediterranean. Um, yeah. I actually saw one eating a squid one time. <laughs> um, uh, we have chat asking if we will be live streaming our dives on the subs, and we will be live streaming the dives, so you can you will be able to watch and tune in for those. And we do turn off our location services, I believe, to protect. So we will dive on the subs, but we try to protect where the locations are for them. Yeah, we um, yeah, there's a, we have a whole procedure. So the basically what we're making sure is that you know the especially at least the underwater video. I mean, you can't really tell where it is, but we got to make sure that all the metadata and everything is is stripped out from what we distribute to the public. So there's the. We're, we're working our way through the checklist. <laughs> and then, Zach, uh, they're saying that there's no high-def model of the goosefish on Sketchfab yet, so what's the holdup? <laughs> oh, he called out. <laughs> um, I don't know. I will make sure that gets up tonight. I know the, the model is done. It could have just gotten overlooked getting it uploaded into Sketchfab. Um, also, the the we, we're building these models, and quite high definition um, and they're they're quite large files and sketchfab is particular about how big a model is so we might also have to go back and reduce that model down a little bit to get it up on the sketchfab but um, yeah it might be on the, the cesium account where but I don't I don't know if that's a public thing yet um, but yeah it's it, it will get up <laughs> it's just a matter of we're, we're trying to get to a certain number on this trip and getting them through and then reducing them down we'll do um, we'll do it at the very end if needed, but it'll it'll be up. What's the number? How many are you trying to get? Uh, we're trying to get at least ten, and we're at. I think after today, after everything finishes, we'll be at eight. So it leaves us with two more. I mean, at least we have plenty more we could do. Um, but to get them to like a presentation level uh, model, it you know we like to play around with a couple things after developing itself. So I was. Um Actually, so this um, this cruise is way more data intensive yeah. uh, than our and, and part of data it is in a different sense, computer data more so than like animal oh, science yeah. data. Just to clarify that for our viewers. And I guess um, and this is really you know this is the all the lessons that we've learned from going from doing this cruise. You know, the idea is okay now you know now we know what this procedure is. So the, the I mean the plan is that this is how we want to operate going forward. But actually a lot of the, the challenges that we've run into, even like the question about um, getting these things up on Sketchfab, mm -hmm. I mean, the issue here is because we're dealing with like all of these images, the making the models, you know, you're dealing with thousands of 6K images. So it'll, I mean, we have a really high end processing computers on board. And even then it'll, a lot of operations will take hours because there's so many photos. And for the, for the uploading, uh, right now, we, the ship, has two different internet connections, and both of them are maxed out, so. We, we have been definitely putting it to its paces, that's for sure. Yeah, we have, a, we have a Starlink Maritime, and we have a traditional VSAT that I talked about uh, a couple days back, and both of them are just, like, absolutely, like, 99% <laughs> just cranking. Yeah. Yeah, and part of this is, like, what Jonathan and I were talking about earlier and figuring out, is it worth having these super high resolution models do you tell a difference when you have 3,000 photos versus 2,000 photos for the model and so yeah we're still in the trial and error and that's part of why you know certain models aren't up yet because we're we're putting them to the highest first and then we'll reduce them down and see um, but we want to make sure we can see the details we're going for such as you know the branches of the corals or or the goosefish on the rock but
And just so everyone knows, we've been taking photogrammetry the whole way up this uh, cliff face here, yeah. which is a thousand feet high. I think uh, are we getting to the top of it here. Oh, Johan, you're not on SPL. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we're definitely getting close. Uh, if we said 12,000 meters was the top of this feature, then we have about 65 meters to go. Okay. So. Well, John is looking for some more coral, so if you can find it for him, let us know. We'll do our best. For uh, a bit of a sense of scale on the computer data side of things, uh, for at, as of where we are right now, all the photogrammetry we've shot just during this dive is we are about uh, 12,000 images from both of the stereo cameras. So we're fortunately, we're, we finally got to the point where we can download faster than we take them. But Rachel, can you explain all the different cameras that we are shooting with and the differences between them? Yeah. Uh, so there's, if you look on Nautilus Live and you click through Stream 1, Stream 2, Stream 3, uh, so you're seeing a total of five different views. Uh, stream 1 and Stream 2 are the, the Insight Pacific, uh, or the Stream 1 is the, the Zeus camera from Insight Pacific that we've, that's been our you know, go-to uh, camera since the beginning of Nautilus. Um, but on stream three, you can see the Triclops wide field camera system that we are testing. And this is the, we've used Triclops on a couple expeditions this year, but this expedition is really built around Triclops and the whole sort of uh, post-processing workflow. The, um, if you look at stream three, so there's a total of three separate cameras uh most of this you can see there's kind of there's two windows one in the lower left one in the lower right and then there's kind of the the background image um so if you look at the lower left and the lower right the these are a stereo pair of cameras uh the one on the left what does stereo pair mean uh so a stereo pair is basically like uh like eyes um the so if you look at like our um you know, the regular human eye, we've, you know, we've got a pair of eyes and they're, and they're symmetrical with respect to each other. Um, so the idea of having the stereo pair is that's, that's kind of like the kind of imagery you'd put into a pair of like 3D, you know, like a VR headset. Um, right now we actually, we, we tweak the config a little bit because we uh, originally, the big camera in the middle, which is the background of that stream three, the plan was originally that was going to be our cinema camera and then we were going to have a left the the left stereo and the right stereo those were going to be for photogrammetry but we've actually found that we've been using the the cinema cameras up higher and we found that for photogrammetry having that you've got the high up perspective and then you've got the the sort of the lower or the lower right corner of that screen is they're they're looking at it from different angles coming down and having that, uh, having that difference in perspective, the different angle, has been really good for the photogrammetry's basically computer depth perception. Um, and that's why you notice the lower left and the lower right are actually, the lower left is like a fisheye view, whereas the lower right is like more of like a normal, what you'd expect to see from a camera. And that was a, we think that was a lesson we learned when we started processing a couple dives back. And there's, throughout this whole expedition, uh, we've tried a lot of different camera layouts, and it, it's really been, you know, because we have so many people on board to help with the data, it's been really helpful because we can, you know, we have an idea of what we think is going to work well, and then we do a dive, we record, and we process it, and we say, oh, well, you know, well, here's, you know, like on a wall versus a, a flat feature versus a slope, you know, this worked well here, this didn't work well here, so let's try and change the layout. And then the next dive, we can say, oh, you know, this worked better. So um, they definitely took probably, I think, five nights of, of cheap tweaking camera positions and changing angles. And like some things were flat versus at a slight angle. But this looks like it's going to be a good, stable config for us. All right. Are we at the top now, Johan? Not quite. Not quite. Not quite. False summit. <laughs> um, Viewers are asking, how much more time do we have left on the bottom? We probably have about five more minutes. 
before we should start heading up. Wow, that time goes quick. Yes, mm -hmm. it does. And then Rachel, here's one for you. They say they're sitting at home with a moderately good internet connection and they're having to wait quite a while to download some of the images. One of the available basalt wall models on Sketchfab has 23 million triangles and 11.5 million vertices. So. <laughs> yeah, and basically, so like the, when we take the individual most dives, it'll turn into probably 10, maybe 15,000 images between the two cameras doing photogrammetry. So, you know, each image is just a 2D representation at that point. So the, eventually what you want to turn it into is um, an actual 3D model. And the, you know, for something like, so you talking about having like all 23 million triangles. So triangles are kind of like the basic component of a 3D model because you can make pretty much anything out of triangles. Yeah. Um, but like one of the things that Zach was mentioning earlier is like, you know, how much, like what resolution is good enough. So that's something where right now, you know, we're recording everything in really ultra high resolution because you know, we need to start at a really good point and then we can start doing the cost benefit, you know, oh, do we really need one image per three seconds? Can we go to one image per four seconds? Um, but yeah, it really gives you the, um, the sense of scale of how big these are. Yeah, you just made Jonathan's night talking about 23 million triangles, whoever you are, because he's, <laughs> he's loving how big these models, or how, what the resolution and, and the amount of info we're putting into these models. Um, and they're asking if the two fisheye cameras are on the porch of the ROV, and I think they're mounted a little above it, right? They're not actually on the porch. We um, we did do a dive with the the stereo pair on the porch, but the issue is that that's right at the bottom of the vehicle, and we try not to put stuff there because the porch is kind of like a bumper. Um, so the actually right now they're mounted on a tray that the forward bio box is usually on. I think you've got the there's the tool tray and then the bio box, which is um, so both the 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 porch and the, the it's right above.